All right, it is Thursday morning, which means it's time for us to check in on the burning platform. This is our chance to update ourselves on all the things that are happening in the news, all the stories that we want to talk about, all the things in politics and society and the international realm. And man, oh man, do we have a lot to discuss this morning. We have, of course, uh, Pumi Mashiho, who is joining me, our co-host. We also have Kanthan Pile, who is uh, ready to join us from his home. Canton, you got lots to talk to you about, and I love those uh, those those paintings behind you. Those are magic. <laughs> the... It's a virtual background, Gareth. I love it. Whatever it is, it's fantastic. All right, and it, then it, we it's, also it's, going... it's a cat versus woman meme, which actually kind of right. dominated right. Uh, social media for a while, and it's been it's a stylized Japanese version, but it's it's not a, a real painting behind me. I love it. Very good. Now, now, nonetheless, it should be. And I think you should actually order them and put them on the wall behind you anyway. <laughs> I don't spend enough time right. in this office to do that. I'm only here about three times a week. Our guest this morning is uh, Colonel Chris Wyatt, a retired U.S. Army colonel intelligence operative with a particular interest, interest in South Africa. He spent a lot of his time uh, in the post-military world making sense of the big changes in politics, the economy, and culture in South Africa. He has a network of informed and well-placed sources that gives him a perspective that a lot of South Africans don't have in their own backyard. And uh, he's got a magnificent beard. Uh, here he is. Chris Wyatt, look at that beard. It's getting more and more magnificent by the day. <laughs> it's actually a lot shorter than it used to be. I trimmed it. It was down to my navel at Christmas, but I trimmed it back. It was getting a little shaggy there. I go exercise and too many people pull off on the side of the road and offer me a lift. I thought I was homeless, so I had to trim it. Homeless or, or Santa Claus? I mean, you must get a lot of uh, offers to, to do. You must get a lot of people asking you to, to come and do Christmas for us, please. Would you tell the kids that you're Santa Claus? No, I do get I do get Santa Claus. I actually do a Christmas show. I do a Christmas Eve show and then a Christmas Day show. It's my birthday and Christmas, so that's kind of why I do it. Oh, and then finally, uh, I, do a, I do a Boxing Day show as well. Very good. Well, you've been working hard. We got a lot to talk to you about this morning. Um, the convention that all the parties had the other day at Emperor's Palace, and I know that um, Canton, you, you were on that show with the Freedom Front, uh, with Courtney Mulder, along with Pumi and I, and uh, some interesting discussions have come from that. Whether or not we've uh, achieved what we wanted to achieve at that multi-party conference, we'll get into in a moment. We got to talk about the BRICS summit, guys, because that's a big story, and we have to talk about uh, Prigozhin being taken out or uh, conveniently disposed of in the air above Russia. So we got lots of things to pick at. Uh, where do you want to start, Pumi? You decide. Dude, so because we had the, the whole 10th birthday EFF and all those images of <laughs> Julius Malema and, and the doom and gloom that came with it and the number of people yeah. who were so freaked out at seeing all of, uh, that sea of red uh, <laughs> at um, the sea of red at FNB Stadium. Yesterday's uh, by-election, there were five by-elections uh, across the country. There was, there was one out here in Blegauri, St. Stithian's, Bryanston area. DA area, DA ward was up. Um, and the DA, it was a whitewash, 97%. Ooh. Is what they got there. Um, but the one that I was most interested in is, is in Bapong, Mad Madibeng is the district. And Bapong is just around the corner from Marikana. Now, one of the many little pieces of the celebrations of the EFF's 10th birthday happened in Marikana, you will remember. So it would be interesting to see right. how they performed, right, in Madibeng. Absolutely. Guess what? What? ANC won. Shocker. The EFF. Shocker. The I'm EFF stunned. didn't even get. They, they, I think they got like a 30% of the vote. And in the parts of the ward that would be their stronghold, they had very little voter turnout. And so I'm just going to say it one more time. I don't know if the EFF is going to, to be the kind of juggernaut that people are afraid oh. they might be next year. Everybody, everybody there were two other by-elections. No, guys, this, this is exactly the point that we made last week with uh, with Corne Mulder because we were pointing out there that filling a stadium is not the same as getting 13 million people out to the polls. 
You know, if you can get yeah. just, you know, barely 100,000 people into a stadium, it's like, you know, people who assume that what happens on Twitter is representative of society. It isn't. I mean, well, the, wearing, are you yeah, wearing red the, by mistake or on, no, on purpose? That's it's not, not red. red. It's orange. It's not Come on. red. <laughs> It's not red. <laughs> All right, well, what do you what do you think of this, Chris? What do you what is your take on this? You're very much a, a fay with what's going on in politics here. Yeah, no, it's um, these by elections I thought were very interesting to say the least. Um, Ninety seven percent for the DA. Well, that's like a Joe Biden mail in ballot. Ninety seven percent in favor. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, sorry. but it was also Plegari and Saints that the end. Yeah. No, the, well, the by-elections are an odd thing for Americans because, you know, we vote for the candidate and then we throw the bum out if we're smart the next time around. We don't vote for a party list mm -hmm. and, and we don't have people removed and, and disappear. The only time something like this would happen is if someone dies, you know, then you have you have an election. But usually in most of our jurisdictions, someone is appointed by governor or something like that to fill out the term. So, yeah, it's just kind of weird for me. Um yeah, no, this, uh, this whole situation is uh, with the EFF. Look, I have said since the EFF's inception, and I'm sticking to this, I haven't changed my position, particularly after the 2019 election and their performance in 2021 when the municipal elections actually lost 2% of their vote total from the previous one, which everybody seems to be missing. Uh, the only uh, the, the IFP gained 2%, but they went from 8 to 26 municipalities because ANC voters stayed home in KZN. But the EFF is a 15% party maximum ever at the national level. And that's what I've said for a long time. And I'm sticking to it again, as Garrett said, filling a stadium is one thing. Uh, remember the national letdown. I mean, I mean, shutdown that occurred just a few weeks prior to that. Nobody showed up for the EFF. It was embarrassing. It's funny. I, I got attacked on um, one of my videos because I posted something and, and somebody wrote and they said, yeah, yeah, it wasn't 92,000. It was over a hundred thousand old men. Get it right. I'm like, come on, you want to quibble over that? What about the national <laughs> letdown just a few weeks ago? I mean, there were more people at a Joe Biden rally than there were at the national letdown. Come on. The EFF is, is not a power in 2024. Not going to happen. That's a fantasy. The question is how far down does the ANC go and can those coalition behave itself and stick to the principles that they grew to when I was down there at Empress Palace. Mm. Mm. All right. Well, that's, that's well, a good question. You know, you, and and what, do you, what do you make of it? I mean, in the in the wake of all this excitement, certainly from the opposition parties uh, about what happened at uh, Kempton Park, wh what do you think uh, we we can glean from this? Is it a bit of a damp squib? Do you think people are excited about it? Is is it going to make a difference? Have these parties come to an arrangement where they will be able to cooperate effectively? Should they be able to get more than fifty percent of the vote? Uh, huh. These are big questions. You have answers. Yeah, they, are. they are big questions. Well, listen, Gareth, the, the thing I said in the aftermath of, of the National Convention was there's four groups of people here that we really need to be concerned about. And two of them will sound the same, but I'll make the differentiation. The first is the public. Does anybody even know about this booming? I mean, <laughs> I talked to South Africans all over the place, including in Campton Park, and like, what? National what? Convention? What, what are you talking about? So that's the first thing, right? And also, what it'll be interesting to see what the election messaging is going to be coming out of that, you know, the four, these four. Well, exactly. And, and, and how they're going to cooperate. But so the first group of people is the public. I mean, does the public even know? And from what I've seen traveling around the country, no, I know more about it than most South Africans and I'm visiting. Second uh, is, is the press. What will the legacy media do about it? Will they be honest and fair about this coalition? And I think they were for the most part, but it's just going to be another story. I think they're going to not think about it much in the near term. The third group of, of folks that um, how they react to this would be the African National Congress. And my advice to the ANC, not that I'd like to see them do well, but my advice to them is simply ignore it. You know, what the ANC should do is say, hey, this is what we're the Well, ANC. that's what Cyril came out and said, you know, no, when but, he was asked. Yeah, he was he, just like, but, he, but he, just, he dismissed it. But I mean, he should have just, he should have said, said, well, look, we've, we understand opposition parties want to form a coalition. That's fine for them. But we're the ANC and, and this is what we can do. This is what we've done. And you know, they don't have a very good argument, but they can try I, to I make one. Well. I don't know that he ignored it. I mean, he did call a, a family meeting on Sunday. He, he exactly. Also, he discussed bricks, but he but went to But did anyone on, watch? No, no, no. But he, he went on about the UDF because it was actually the UDF's what, 40th, 40th anniversary. 40th right. anniversary. So he took the opportunity to to kind of he, he shouldn't even have acknowledged these th this opposition. Exactly. Party. That's he, what I'm saying. That's You've got to, he, he, must have felt a little bit, he must have felt a little bit threatened by this. And he must have thought he had to defend the, the history of the UDF, which is odd. I mean, if 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 he wasn't threatened at all, he wouldn't even mention it. But well, I think seeing them 
create such a, a, a woo-ha around the, the anniversary of the UDF is indicative of exactly how they are feeling, right? The threat. Because what they're trying to do is they're trying to resuscitate some of and drum up some of that old support and, mm -hmm. and see if they can bring the nostalgia back. And, you know, always, again, this is, it's like, we, we've spoken about this. It's like when you're in a waiting relationship, there are two things that the person that's trying to save the relationship does. One, grand gestures, right? So you see it as they try and have like every year a big birthday party. And two, they try and like kind of remind you of the good old days. And that's what they're doing with this UDF thing. But that's but, not going to work very well because over half the population was born after the end of apartheid and they don't have ties to the old days. They've forgotten about it or don't care about it. I don't want to hear from grandpa what used to happen. Those are voters going away. But the fourth group here, that's the most important group of those four different groupings that needed to know about this convention are likely voters, not registered voters, but likely voters. People are going to get off their bum, go to the station, actually, you know, not that ballot and uh, see if they actually vote. And that's what this coalition needs to focus on. And they talk about getting the voters who aren't registered and those who haven't voted to get the vote. That's great. But they also have to have a strategy of poaching ANC voters. If you're the IFP and you're in KZN, the ground is ripe to get ANC voters. You've got municipalities. If you show improvement in service delivery, you can go, hey, look at this. You should vote for us. There's something other than the African National Congress. That's what they should be focused on. Will they do it? We'll see. Well, I think it's just as fascinating to see that straight out the bat, coming out of that convention, the first thing that we hear is, did you even know that the IFP had a youth wing? <laughs> what? Actually, actually, I did. But I, that's, I was <laughs> like, what? They, they have a youth? What? They, they and have they come out. Time. I mean, they've definitely got a geriatric wing. Oh. But the IFP's youth wing comes out guns blazing hate the idea why are we even having this conversation what is uh, that for me was so left field right i didn't <laughs> besides the fact that i really did not think other than sabisa i did not think they had lots of young people in the ifp but to hear them come out and very strongly oppose the idea of being part of this coalition i was just like damn guys at least Can get your people on site what did you think of the, these multi-party negotiations and talks and this coalition means? Do you think it has any lasting impact? You know, I, I was thinking back to the time when I used to be a frequent flyer, guys. And, you know, you are either a member of the Star Alliance or you're a member of the One World Alliance. And you were in these partnerships. So if you were not able to fly on your particular choice of, uh, of airline, in my case, it was British Airways, um, I would end up flying Cathay Pacific or would end up flying Qatar. And, you know, it's all very useful if you want to get to parts of the world where people actually don't understand that you exist. And I feel, you know, pretty much that way in terms of what's going on right now. Remember what Trump had to say when, in terms of why he didn't take part in the uh, Republican debates. Yeah. He, was basically, he was basically pointing out that, you know, he is the 800-pound gorilla in the room and you know, no matter how many of them get together, all of their collective points still add up to less than how he's tracking the polls. So why should he actually end up bothering about it? You know, and interesting, you know, uh, to the point that uh, uh, Chris White was saying a second ago, people who are 47 years old um, now, <clears throat> you know, if you, if you think about it, who are going to be voting next year, who are not eligible to vote under apartheid. OK, yeah. so so basically the only people that you can be speaking to right now who have any recollection whatsoever around what was going on at the time are the people who are already uh, uh, 50 years and older. And more to the point around the, uh, the United Democratic Front, the person who was actually single handedly responsible for pulling the UDF together was Alan Busak. And Alan Busak <laughs> extended the middle finger to them. He said, I want absolutely nothing to do with this. Alan Pusak and Popo Mulefe, that little spat, if they had been on, on Twitter, it would have been an epic battle, an epic, oh, it's not called Twitter, what do they call the, the tours now? What do they yeah, call no. the tour now since it's an X? Yeah. But that, that Alan Pusak and Popo Mulefe spat two weeks ago was definitely giving me life. <laughs> 
Uh, by the way, Bong Ngema says in the comments, um, I was a member of the IFP Youth Brigade back in the 80s, Pumi. So there was a youth brigade. And VK says the IFP's youth league existed since the late 90s in KwaZulu-Natal campuses. So <laughs> it may be news to some of us, but clearly not to everybody. So we've got smart people <laughs> listening to it. All right. Guys, if I, if I still lived in KZN, I probably would vote IFP. So, you know, there's that. Yeah. I mean, they, they certainly seem to be appealing to a much broader group of people than they were originally established to to appeal to i mean it was very much a, a zulu party in kwazulu natal and i think that's well, changed quite a lot for the ifp hmm, i don't know if it's changed quite a lot i mean and and looking one thing we started to out the show talking about by-elections um mm -hmm. you know the one thing that is not reported on as much as it should be i think is the rising number of uh, political killings happening again in KZN. Just a couple of days ago in Guanongoma, an NFP, which is another really strong regional party in the in KZN, an a NFP councillor, uh, there was an attempted assassination on him and the community actually caught the guy that tried to kill him. There are political killings between the ANC, IFP and um, NFP happening in KZN like you can't believe. So every time you see a by-election in KZN, chances are it's because the incumbent has been killed. Wow. Frightening. That's a and, very scary thing. And no one's talking about that. Well, well, like, Pumi, Pumi, we don't talk about it because the killings have never stopped. Yeah, exactly. Mm. It's been continuous. I and mean, no, this is, and that's why I'm saying a rise in those killings yeah. as well, you know, is what we've been seeing. Kind of as as this battle is hotting up, Chris, you talk about how the the ANC in KZN is is bleeding voters to the ANC to the in IFP. Well, to not voting, but maybe to the IFP if the IFP is smart. But they just didn't vote in twenty twenty one. Yeah, and and that's one of the things that you're also seeing is that there is a heated battle for those seats. There is a heated battle for who is going to wrestle control of what's happening in KZN. And in KZN, it also comes with guns and violence. Indeed. Guys, uh, the, the president is making a huge fuss of bricks. Uh, some people <laughs> in, in South Africa are extremely excited about this. They see it as an opportunity for a new uh, world with, with not just one pole, with America being this hegemonic power that the dollar is the only currency that we could trade with internationally. Some some big ideas being flown in the skies with jets and uh, on the ground with police everywhere. We see, <laughs> we see President Cyril really trying his best to uh, prove to his BRICS compatriots uh, that we're also at the table, that we are a real country, that we can, we, we want to host this thing. I mean, Putin's not here for whatever reason. He's busy assassinating his enemies. Who knows? But a big fuss being made uh, in Santon. Uh, what do you what do you make of BRICS, and do you think anything will come of this? And Canton, you've been uh, decried by many members of our audience for your, uh, your your take on Russia and China and India, and the way that the world is moving. Some people saying that you uh, you know that you you you're kind of those are your your people now. Those are, those are the people we should look to as South Africa. It's not exactly what you've said, but what is your take? On this BRICS conference, what would you like to see come out of it? And do you think it's worth paying the amount of attention that the president is to it? And certainly that news outlets in South Africa seem to be paying to it in a sycophantic sort of way. I think that in terms of what's going to happen to the international monetary system, this is probably the single biggest thing that has occurred in more than 50 years. Because essentially from the time of the Vietnam War, which is when... Uh, Nixon decoupled the US dollar from having any intrinsic value and then enforced is essentially an imperialist policy that said that you're only going to buy fuel uh, as in uh, use, making use of US dollars. It effectively created a scenario where the uh, US dollar was boss in the world. Now, mm. The problem with that is that there's no intrinsic value to the US dollar other than the ability to buy fuel. And when you decouple the ability to buy fuel from the US dollar, 
which is what's happening in BRICS right now, because you've got Russia, which is one of the world's biggest producers of oil. You now have both Saudi Arabia and Iran who are lining up to join in BRICS. And at the same time, you've also got uh, Venezuela kind of champing at the bit to get in there. And remember, Venezuela has massive reserves in terms of oil. If you have all of them now effectively entering BRICS, and they are putting forward a suggestion that one has a payment system that is actually based on intrinsic value. And the intrinsic value doesn't have to be gold. It can be whatever resources are actually produced by the member countries. So it can be mm. oil in the case of the Saudis and the Iranians. It can be gold, uranium, manganese in the case of South Africa and in the case of, uh, of Russia. It can be rare earth uh, elements in the case of, uh, of China. But what this means is that you can actually now forge a global payment system that is decoupled from the U.S. dollar, which effectively <laughs> means that all of the sovereign debt that the U.S. has been accumulating, which has been based on the idea that you are always going to be able to go back to the U.S. dollar because it is the reserve currency. So the U.S. is now tanking. If you look in terms of the long-term bond yields, uh, so now you have an inverted yield curve in uh, in the U.S. I've written about this in uh, in the past. Essentially, what an inverted yield curve means, it means that if you buy U.S. bonds today, it has a higher interest rate than long-term U.S. bonds. What this means is that the markets around the world are saying, we don't have confidence in the future of the dollar. We're going to put money into buying U.S. bonds right now because we believe you're going to be able to pay right now. But if we put it forward to the future, we actually don't believe that you're going to be able to do that. Uh, I saw a calculation uh, this week that said effectively the debt burden upon every single American as individuals right now, every single American taxpayer as individuals, is in the order of 272000 U.S. dollars. Hmm. So how on earth, when you have an economy that is... Um, basically in decline, no matter what people say. How do you end up repaying that type of debt over the long term? So, yes, BRICS is important, guys, for, for the very simple reason that the rest of us who run our economies based on, on real things, and look, South Africa produces real things. We now actually have the opportunity to get real value in terms of our trading partners without needing this intermediary that, you know, frankly, has been the biggest con going for the past 50 years. Well, let the American come in on this one. Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> uh, okay, listen, okay. First of all, somebody earlier said I missed my calling. They said I should be a sports uh, broadcaster. Actually, I am. I do rugby. I My own brand, Rugby Ascendant, and I do Springboks test matches and URC and Curry Cup. Anyway, uh, listen, Canthan is a really smart guy, and I enjoy being on panels with him, but uh, we are, um, this is Mars and Venus here, a completely different view of this. The reason the U.S. currency went off of the gold standard wasn't to make the U.S. a hegemon, not that Canthan was implying this, or to, or to, you know, make it back by oil. It's because Charles de Gaulle tried to destroy America. Up until Nixon took us off the gold standard, you took U.S. currency, and the U.S. government had to give you gold in exchange for it. And de Gaulle tried to bankrupt America. He was angry in the 60s. And so he did that. And a lot of people started trying to get gold from the U.S. government. So they had to go off the gold standard. Otherwise, our gold reserves would have been completely depleted. We wouldn't have had any. As far as intrinsic value, um, it sounds like uh, maybe I'm inferring incorrectly, but Kent then is talking about bartering for things. You know, I mean, it's uh, no money. It's all it's all fiat money. There's no nothing's backed by anything except the good, good faith and confidence. And that's why this idea of a BRICS currency is interesting and it could have potential, but I see it right now. It's just a red herring. It's just, it's utter nonsense. First off, China's currency, according to the International Monetary Fund, the yuan or renminbi is convertible. But do you, Pumi, do you have renminbi in your pocket? I don't. <laughs> I've had pounds and, and I've had rands and I've had pula, uh, but I never had Chinese yuan in my pocket. No one trades that in Europe or in Africa, anywhere. You can't get it. So if the second largest economy in the world which got there by hook and crook, by the way. It went from $2 trillion in 2000 to $16 trillion. Now, if that economy's currency isn't something that people want to buy already, how is a group of, you know, an acronym created by a Goldman Sachs analyst 21 years ago or 22 years ago going to come up with a currency in the near term that's going to displace the dollar? And that's not just pro-American because I'm an American. It's just the reality. 
you know, if you go back 30 years ago, the world saw many international currencies that were traded frequently. The dollar, the pound, the Swiss franc, the German Deutschmark, and the Japanese yen were all heavily traded. The dollar wasn't the super dollar so far as international trading that it is today. Yes, oil is always traded in dollars, but international transactions were settled in all those currencies. But today, it's really about 85% in dollars. The euro came about and the mark went away and Japan has stagnated. And as a consequence, traders have gone with the dollar. But the biggest financial center in the world is actually in London. Trillions of dollars flow through London every day in Canary Wharf. And most of those, do- most of those are dollars. I-, I don't see a BRICS currency being anything fun- uh, tangible in the near term. Uh, maybe down the road is possible, but this is really just China trying to get its way and deflect and anti-Western sort of thing. And good luck to them if they pull it off, but uh, I won't be buying any renminbi or BRICS currency soon. What are they hmm. calling the currency? R5. Now, R5 is a, is a term that I put out on Twitter um, a while back based on the fact that the, the five <laughs> current BRICS members all have currency that begins with the letter R. But I was uh-huh. pointing out at the time that um, what you're going to have in this scenario is not going to be a currency that one keeps in one's pocket. This is not going to be that type of currency. It's basically going to be a common set of rules for exchanging value between countries. Uh, guys, you know, I started, you know, writing a fairly uh, longish piece to try and explain what's actually going on here. And I started off, uh, and this is for Chris's benefit, to, uh, by <laughs> saying, you know, there, there's a quote in Douglas Adams' posthumous work, The Salmon of Doubt, where he described a set of rules that describe our reactions to technologies. And he basically has three rules. He says, anything that's in the world when you've been born is normal and ordinary and it's just a natural part of the way in which the world works. Anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35, you see that as new and exciting and revolutionary, and you can probably get a career at it. Anything that's invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. And the problem is right now, for people like, uh, like Chris and myself, who are in that over 35 category, we easy, not easy able, now, we, can't no, no, we, no, 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 we're not <laughs> able to actually conceptualize a world that is so fundamentally different because we've gotten used to this idea that, you know, we need to carry dollars or pounds in our, in our pockets. Now, actually, we're going to be ending up swiping wherever we happen to go. And the idea of actually needing to carry any particular currency in your pocket is going to be something that is so completely outdated. We have street vendors right now in the townships in South Africa who have card machines with them that allow them to accept payments. And, you know, increasingly this idea that one needs to have a global reserve currency that one carries is not there. Now, more to the point, the idea of the dollar as the reserve currency is uh, was something that was actually posed as an alternative to that which was proposed by by John Maynard Keynes, who was actually proposing a payment uh, uh, framework that is not dissimilar to what um, uh, Dilma Rousseff, who is now heading up the BRICS Bank, was actually talking about in terms of the framework for the BRICS currency. The BRICS currency is not going to be something you keep in your pocket. The BRICS currency is going to be an international standard that you measure the value of your currency against. Once it used to be uh, that you measured your currency against gold. Once it used to be that you measured your currency against silver. Once it used to be that you measured your currency against salt. That's where the word salary comes from because salt was uh, such a precious commodity and people used to get paid in the equivalent of salt. You know, going back to the the time of the, the Babylonians, currency, the you actually issued scrip against the value of grain that was stored in vats. So this is not something that that is new or outrageous. It's something that's actually been part of, uh, of human history. And really what's happening right now is that you are removing the ability of effectively one country to control payments throughout the world. And the US controls payments throughout the world because of the fact that they effectively control SWIFT. SWIFT is the international payment systems. And because of the fact that the U.S. is able to disconnect people from SWIFT, they are able to control the free flow of value around the world. So they were able to shut off people like Venezuela. They were able to shut off people like Iran. And then suddenly they tried doing that 
with uh, with Russia, and that basically triggered a wave around the world where countries were saying, if they can do this to Russia, why would they not also do this to my country? And so you've seen everyone going through this process of reducing the U.S. dollar reserves and looking for alternatives, well, but the alternatives are not encouraged. There, there, yeah. there was an even more egregious use of this by, by a government against its own citizens in Canada. When yep. you had the, the truck driver protest and uh, Justin Trudeau and his government decided to actually cut those people off from their funds, their own money, um, using these systems. Right, Chris? Well, Farage, Farage has had his bank account closed. You know, let's yeah, put that, that in perspective. Mm -hmm. hmm. right. Yeah, that too. No, it, it, absolutely. Listen, um, Canthan's onto something here. The SWIFT thing is a real issue. I mean, Namibia wanted to buy jet fighters from China, and we didn't allow that, the U.S. government, because the transactions had to go through a bank in New York. We were able to shut that down. So, yes, that's, that's a true story. That absolutely is the case. But, yeah, with the Canadians, but, I mean, this goes back to – Okay, Kathan, look, I'm, in, I'm like Inspector Gadget. I'm an early adopter of everything. I've been writing code <laughs> since I was a teenager. I, mean, I use IBM data punch cards. I, look, so I'm, I'm, I'm not a fossil <laughs> as I get older that, that can't change and can't imagine a different world. I can. But even in the fifth element, which you guys were talking about in the last hour, they delivered the post. It wasn't even email. And that was made in 98. But, uh, but seriously, no, the, the thing about all of this uh, that should worry people is how easy it is to control. It'll just be a matter of time before I go to the petrol station and I pull the handle out and I start start pumping my petrol and I get to about five liters and it stops because I've exceeded my social credit score or I've exceeded my carbon output score and they can shut down my card. I can't pay in cash. You know, I go to Starbucks here in South Africa occasionally and they say, we are responsibly cashless. And I said, really? So you don't let poor people buy your Starbucks? And they look at me like I'm crazy. Well, not everybody can get a credit card or a debit card. And I, I, mean, I don't want to hear about this ubiquitous thing. Everybody's going to have one. This is mm -hmm. a serious control issue. I think people should be very concerned about this. And yes, Kent, then I agree with you that uh, it, the, the BRICS is intended to be this uh, method to pay things, international transactions. But I mean, right now, the Russians have no problem with their trade with India. I mean, there's so many rupees that the Russians can't use the rupees and the Indians aren't giving them any, they aren't giving them any grain or wheat or, or rice or something that's going to make up for it. So it's here's the one more piece when it comes to that. Having one currency, and I'm not advocating, if it's a euro, fine, I'm not going to lose any sleep. If it's, if it's the rand, I, well, maybe the rand I might lose sleep. But if it's, if it's an international currency, I don't lose sleep. But when you have multiple methods of payment, there are people who extract value along the way, and you get screwed. When I lived in Botswana, I'm paid in dollars. That's my salary, but I'm in Botswana. And in order to buy petrol in South Africa, at that time, the banks had this deal where you couldn't use credit cards, only debit cards. And I didn't have a South African debit card. So every time I came across the border – with my 4.7 liter V8 engine, which needs a lot of petrol, I had to carry a wad of cash. Well, that's dangerous. So I got myself a, a debit card from Botswana, from Bidvest, but I'm paid in dollars. I change at the pool. I lose 10 to 15% in exchange there from people taking. Then when I go to the bank at Bidvest, they put the pool into RAND and I lost another 15%. Before I bought a, a liter of petrol, I've been screwed out of 25% of my money. And that's one of the problems when you have multiple mechanisms. I'm not saying it... You know, the margins can be small, but there is potential there that a lot of value will be lost by people producing. And who loses out there? It's the base producer, the commodity producer, the low end of the chain. They're the ones that really get screwed on us. People always complain about the price of coffee. Well, coffee pickers don't make that much money. It's the middlemen and the packagers. <laughs> you know, and the right. thing just but also just listening to to this high level conversation around BRICS and around the, the various um, monetary systems in place for whether for or against, I think one of the things that often gets lost in having this conversation here at home is the fact that the S in BRICS is a very small S, South Africa. You know? A very small S. And and when when we and the numbers, you know, the numbers just came out just in terms of GDP and the parity between the BRICS uh, countries and the G7 countries. The IMF just released those numbers a couple of days ago. And I was reading a document yesterday that was prepared by um, Proudly South African, I think, around South Africa and its role. in. And every way you look at it, every way that you slice it, I think South Africa is always a loser. We're at the losing end here. Oh, no, Pumi, you're completely wrong. No, 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 you're down, completely wrong. Calm down. I'll, I'll give you figures. I'll give you figures. I'll give you figures. You have prejudice. I have figures. 
No, I have figures too. So just calm down. Just oh, calm down. Oh, it's burning on the burning platform now. I thought it was hot in here. No, well, no, Poopy, stop being so negative no. about our country. We are the biggest exporter to the rest of Africa. The rest of the continent how much, buys okay, single-handedly okay. from South Africa. So yeah, it doesn't about, matter that it's three percent of on the on this continent. The fact that we there are the eight hundred pound gorilla. Boom all over the world, and South Africa has not seen a bounce back in our in our economy. All over the world, including those BRICS countries, and South Africa has not seen a bounce back in our economy. Have we? Yes, we have. Am I wrong? Oh, yes, wait, yes, we the, have. Because you for, you're forgetting, Pumi, and this is something we've talked about on this show before. You consider that the majority of South Africa's economy actually doesn't flow through the banking system. And the only way that you track the economy of South Africa currently is by what actually flows through the banking system. But the majority of the people of this country remain unbanked. The majority of commerce that flows through the, the streets of our townships does not go through the formal banking structures. And if you look in terms of what is happening on the ground, and it actually requires that we get out of studios and actually go into the townships and see what's actually happening in terms of businesses that are springing up. We're talking about cash businesses, you know, that people set up in townships where they're exchanging goods for services on a daily basis. And you can actually see the boom happening on the ground. It just so happens that all of the formal structures have been taking a pounding, and there are many reasons why well, they've been taking a pounding. So, so you know, I, it's yeah. I don't, I don't disagree with anything that Canton has just said, Pums, in terms of, of our importance to the rest of this continent. And I think the world sees Africa as an enormous opportunity that they need to get involved it's in. It's the reason but, why they want us in Briggs, because we're the gateway. Right, but exactly. right. it's the reason exactly. they want us no, in Briggs, Pumi, because we're on. the gateway. You're, you're spot on. Not because we are so important, it's simply no, because agree. we are gateway into the okay. continent. But, but what, I, what I want to make the point about is we should then do a whole lot more about getting the rest of Africa to like us again rather than to hate us. <laughs> well, quit, quit sending and causes on me, Dalai Zuma, to, uh, to the African Union. That'll help. Yeah, well, this is the point, right? So we, we, we are responsible for, for being the gateway for all this trade within the continent, intra-African trade, all that sort of thing. But the rest of Africa is not thrilled with us, and they're very suspicious of our motives, rightly so. Uh, we're extraordinarily xenophobic when people do come here. And we've tried to throw our weight around on this continent, and, and it hasn't got us friends. It's got us enemies. Uh, Francophone Africa wants nothing to do with us, and much of Anglophone Africa is completely uh, outside of our reach as well. Certainly, the Department of International Relations and Cooperation has done nothing to help any of that. Don't you Gareth, agree? Uh, uh, Gareth, as you know, I regularly fly up to Zimbabwe because I do work up there. On all, nearly every single flight that I'm up, the, the flights are full. Mm -hmm. And who are they filled with? They're filled with white Afrikaners. Why are they mm -hmm. flying to Zimbabwe? Because they are doing work up there. They work in the mining sector up there. Yes, it's true that on the ground there is this, I, I would say, well-earned perspective that, you know, South Africans are generally disdainful of people north of the Limpopo and that we are xenophobic and all of that. But at the same time, the flow in terms of talent and intellectual capital that goes from South Africa to north of the Limpopo and actually doing real stuff on the ground, it's absolutely huge. Mm -hmm. We must not actually, you know, use the, uh, the equivalent again in terms of Twitter, you know, where you amplify the fact that there's xenophobia but you fail to actually understand what's happening on the ground in terms of the free flow of commerce. Zimbabwean mining would not exist as it currently is. And trust me, Zimbabwean mining is huge. It would not exist without the Boers on the ground who are actually helping it. I don't disagree, but we could do a lot more to improve our relations with these other countries. And, and certainly they're no big fans of ours is what I'm saying. We, we, we have a Department of International Affairs. We should be using them to enforce and reinforce our relationships within Africa before we start worrying about pleasing our masters at BRICS.
Well, Gareth, to reinforce your point there, sorry, to reinforce no. the point is, um, you know, I've lived in Tunisia, Liberia, Botswana, Malawi, Niger, Mauritania, Uganda, and Ethiopia, all over the continent. I've worked in over 40 countries in Africa. And uh, among political elites, that is very much an impression of South Africa is it's arrogant. Mm -hmm. It throws its weight around, you know, and South Africans are in the elite circles are fond of disdain on America about being interventionist. But no one's been more interventionist in Africa than South Africa. And that's resented by a lot of folks as you know, Burundi and Ethiopia and Congo and Ivory Coast. The list goes on and on. I'm not speaking ill. Those who know me know that I have a great affinity for South Africa. I think it's a wonderful country with great potential. And I hope it gets there. But uh, this is this is a true impression. It matters. But let me go back real quick. Uh, I don't want to forget this because can't then touch on something I think is very important when it comes to economics. He was referring to the informal economy. Uh, much of Africa survives on the informal economy and it's not captured in economic output. That's a true statement. And that, that's why Africans don't starve to death every day in places that are desperately poor, like Gabon, well, Gabon or Congo, a place like that. But that's all fine and dandy. And that's important for economists and for those dealing with countries to understand. But the reality is that um, that economic output has little bearing on international trade, on a country's wealth. It's just people exchanging things so they survive. But it is important to remember. Important to remember. So I, I just want to bring that back because uh, Kantham mentioned that, and I think that's where I was getting at. The informal econ economy in Africa should be measured, and it's important to know that it's there. And there is a distinction, Pumi. I, I agree with Kantham on this one. Now, Kantham and I agree now, so, so pay attention. <laughs> yeah, so, so on this point, I agree with him that, um, that yeah, the, the formal economy in South Africa has been brutalized. The, we have not seen it spring back. Folks, I have seen so many businesses that are collapsed, traveling in six provinces on this trip yet again. I, I've been here three times this past year, and it's just it's getting worse for so many people. And that formal economy has a knock on effect because the formal economy employs domestics, employs retailers, employs clerks, employs all the petrol station tents. When those people lose jobs, it has an impact on the informal economy. So the thing about the, the formal economy, as much as we can say the people are not starving to death, the reality of it is that South Africa and where we are, our influence on the continent is also because of the kind of sophistication that we have in our formal economy. Yes. And the reason our, our influence on the, on the continent has also waned as much as it has is simply because we have not done enough in the formal economy to keep ourselves up there. Again, and it is also, it's about when you think about our relationship with America, when you think about our relationship with, even with China, right? So they only see us as a gateway. I, when I look at the numbers, Canton, this is not the feelings, these are the numbers. When I look at the numbers in terms of how much the BRICS countries spend with us versus what we spend with them, it is completely overturned. We do not make the kind of money from that relationship as it is touted to be. And it is simply because what we are really is we are simply sending out our commodities for very little in return. And I think that the conversation around BRICS is a conversation that says, oh, BRICS is good for us. BRICS is good for us as South yeah. Africans. I don't know if BRICS is as good as they say it is for us. Maybe it is good for the individuals. Maybe it is good for the people who get IPPs. Maybe it is good for people who are in Cyril's corner. But it is not good for South Africans as a whole. Right. Let me let me ask this quickly, because I, I know Canton's itching to bring up uh, all kinds of other things. We haven't talked about Prigozhin at all. We haven't talked about uh, Joe <gasps> Biden Maui, and we have to get to that. But Chris, you, you you worked in intelligence. What do you think the U.S. response to all of this BRICS is this BRICS nonsense is going to be? Because I say nonsense, but essentially to the Americans, this is a threat. Which it's war talk. Have, yeah, it's saber rattling. That's what it is. It in 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 dark rooms, you're going to have intelligence people busy figuring out ways to thwart the plans of BRICS. What do you think the American response is going to be? Well, I think the smartest response for the U.S. State Department, and if somebody wakes up Joe Biden, for him to respond would be to simply ignore it. I mean, um, you know, if people ask him about the BRICS summit, they should say there was fuck all loaded onto that summit. You know, nothing's happening there. Um, that's, I think, what uh, I think that should be the approach. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, look, if if a group of countries want, let me look back to the 1960s and 70s. They had the non-aligned movement. India was a big player in that. What, does anybody know about that? What did it accomplish? A third way. Look, if China wants to do this, that's fine. But th there would be a threat here to U.S. economic prosperity if there's actually a BRICS currency that people trade in, which Canton is talking about. They, that could be a threat to U.S. It would be certainly a threat to U.S. global hegemony. 
But that's not happening anytime soon. I think the smartest reaction from the United States government is simply to ignore it. When asked about it, say, yeah, we understand that there's that, that they're meeting. And, you know, I, I would take the same approach that I, I offer to the ANC regarding the, the coalition against them. Just ignore it and, and, and move on. The U.S. needs to clean up its act with regard to Ukraine and a number of other issues before we um, worry too much about BRICS. I think they're more pressing issues for the United States than BRICS. As I was uh, alluding to uh, Tandy Modisi's comment there, um, <laughs> there is, <laughs> there is, uh, sorry, the lady art has to make it in the conversation at some point. But uh, no, it's, uh, it's, there's, there's nothing substantive here that I'm seeing. I've been at the BRICS the past two days. I'll go again this morning before I fly back to Cape Town. It's uh, we'll see. I think the best approach is just to to just dismiss and ignore it. Chris, you know, you spoke about yeah. how um, Charles de Gaulle tried to destroy America because he has well, our currency. Yeah, yeah. the currency because well, bankrupt America. Yeah. No, but, my but, my congressmen are doing that. We don't need but, Charles de Gaulle's no, 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 help for but, that. <laughs> but, the, but but where that stems from is it actually stems from a grudge that comes from the Second World War. Yes, from when America destroyed the. The French fleet, because they, because when they, well, yeah, kept, the, the, the when Brits they actually destroyed French, but it was, to, it was it was a grudge. You're absolutely correct. That's right. To Germany, yeah, that's the the fear of the Vichy it, France the, fleet. You're talking about, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And South Africa is in the same position. If the BRICS currency becomes a reality, what America cannot afford is America cannot afford for South Africa, which is so influential on the continent, but also the gateway into the continent and the most sophisticated banking system on the continent. Correct. America cannot afford for us to fall into the hands of that side of the equation. And if they must, they will destroy us, even though they are our friends. From that standpoint, Pumi, I would have to agree with you that, that, that South Africa is important in so many respects. That way. That's why it's, it's so sad to see the country gray listed for allowing illicit transactions and, and terrorist financing to flow through here. I agree with you. That is, you know, at the uh, the South African ambassador to BRICS was quoted in IOL last week, I think it was, saying that uh, AGOA won't end for South Africa because there's 600 U.S. companies trading here. <laughs> uh, he really doesn't know what he's talking about. If we have time, we get to that. But but yeah, it, it is an important relationship. Uh, the U.S. has a bilateral relationship with South Africa, and it's one that's worth maintaining and improving. Um, and it's it's not good to see it fall the other way. I agree with 100% there. I right. just want to put in perspective this thing around the... Um uh, the non-aligned movement, uh, uh, Chris, you know, just a yeah. bit of historical perspective here. At the time that the non-aligned movement actually existed, we essentially had the world split into into three segments. We had the first world, which is the collective West today. We have the second world, which was the entire communist bloc. And we had the third world, which was everyone else. And the third world was effectively the non-aligned movement. And what we have right now today is we still have the first world, the collective West, except if you look in terms of the degradation of infrastructure and uh, and just the social fabric of those countries, they're effectively on the path to being uh, where the second world was during the communist era. But what you have is all of the former communist countries who are now very much um, fully developed societies that have now partnered with the third world. And so the entire concept of what happened to the non-aligned movement, the non-aligned movement is effectively now very much part of BRICS. All of the countries that used to comprise the non-aligned movement are now lining up to join BRICS. So the short answer is that that's what effectively happened um, in terms of that. But, you know, guys, to get back to, um, uh, to the, the core point out here, if I want uh, to use a very concrete example, I think nearly all of us are aware that yesterday India successfully landed a spacecraft on the moon. Yeah, South Pole of the okay. Moon. Very good. Very yeah, good so work. they landed on the South Pole of the Moon. Okay, now to put this in, in perspective, all right, the cost of India's mission to put the spacecraft on the Moon was 75 million US dollars. Huh? Now, the reason why I think this is important, okay, is that you consider that the budget for the movie Interstellar was 184 <laughs> million dollars. <laughs> Okay, an actual space project launched by India in dollar terms is less than half the cost of producing a movie about a right. fake space project. Now, why is this important? Okay, it comes back to the fact of what is intrinsic value. And the fact is that intrinsic value translates to the cost of actually acquiring intellectual capital in India which compared to paying uh, the price in U.S. dollars is actually incredibly low. 
And, and, what, and so the, the entire idea that you go to the Americans and get them to put a spacecraft um, uh, on the moon, as opposed to going to the Indians, makes you realize how the idea of actually spending money in dollars actually has no intrinsic value. Because if you are buying the same um, talent, the same outcomes from places in other parts of the world, then your money is actually being better spent. And so if you cut out the US dollar framework and you deal directly uh, in between, remember that Jacob Zuma wanted to spend a trillion rand on putting a nuclear power plant in place. Yeah. Okay, so it was a trillion rand that we would pay off over a 20 year period. And there was complete and utter outrage from people. Uh, Pumi, I remember that you were one of the people who was outraged about this. The, the idea that we were going to spend a trillion rand over a 20 year period. Well, guys, we are burning through 300 million rand of diesel per year right now to keep the lights on. So, okay, yeah. so just uh, understand that the idea of actually buying a nuclear power plant from the Russians absolutely made sense. So this all comes back to the question of what is the value we're getting from BRICS? Pumi, that is the basic value that we are getting. We have this ability to cut out the rent seeker. You remember the analogy that uh, Chris was using just now in terms of when he needed to do payment when he came from Botswana down into South Africa and all of the various rent seekers on the way. Michael Jordan has effectively ripped out um, the underpinnings of that entire system by creating a bank that charges zero for financial transactions. Because effectively, that is what is going to happen in inter-country uh, trade at the point at which you have uh, Dilma Rousseff's vision actually coming through. And I urge you guys to actually take a look at everything that she's had to say on the subject. You know, she is the former president of Brazil, um, and she has been talking quite extensively on what they are actually um, uh, envision in terms of where this framework is going to go. So BRICS is big. It, it's absolutely right. huge. Biggest thing that's happening in the world. Uh, we've, we've done enough on BRICS uh, because I think the, there's <laughs> much to be done. Uh, the, the, the other thing that we've got to talk about, the Republicans had their first debate last night. Donald Trump was not there, as Canton's already told us. He went and Tucker Carlson's show instead and said, I don't need to be there. The other guys are one, maybe two, maybe three percent. I don't need to do this. That kind of thing. So he's not playing the game. Um, and why should he? But Donald Trump will not get enough votes if he only relies on his base. Uh, a lot of Americans do not like him. For whatever reason, they've made up their mind already. Donald Trump is baked into the pie. Uh, Ron DeSantis is not going to be a thing by the looks of this debate anyway. Uh, does any of this mean anything for the upcoming elections? Because the American election season starts way earlier than anybody else's. And is Joe Biden actually sentient enough to know what's going on, let alone in bricks, but in his own backyard? <laughs> Chris, <laughs> well, yeah, let's go it. with the American. Okay. Well, Joe Biden is not sentient enough to know what's going on in his own backyard. Uh, I heard your comments about what he said in Maui. It's despicable, but uh, that's just who Joe Biden is. It's who he's always been. Uh, Trump not going to the Republican debate was probably the best thing for the Republican Party from the following standpoint. All of his opponents would have simply said, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. And they would have whined the whole time. It would have been about Trump and indictments and all this nonsense. There would have been right. nothing substantive discussed at the debate. I didn't watch it. I had my radio program last night uh, and it was a bit late, so I'm not really sure what was said, but there would have been nothing useful coming out of the debate if Trump was there. It would have been all about Trump. And look at what he did with the debates in 2016, you know, little Lion Ted and little Marco and all that stuff. And it just was very distracting. It wasn't much substantive taking place there. So, and from the second point, which you mentioned, Gareth, um, why does Trump need to go? There's nothing to be gained from it. But as far right. as um, who's going to vote for Trump, um, there's a lot of independent voters that, that still like Trump. Look, I, I don't like the guy. I think he's a cad. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's a bore. But uh, his policies were, by and large, very effective. There are some exceptions to that. But uh, his policies were, by and large, very effective. And, and America was recovering from a long um, period of um, stagnation, I would say, not decline, but stagnation. And we've gone completely the opposite now. I mean, my electric bill was $93 a few years ago. I'm using 20% less, less electricity. I feel like I'm an ESCOM customer. It was $227 in July from 93 my petrol cost 220% more than it did on the last Whoa. day Trump was president. 
yeah, this stuff is eviscerating people. I, I might have to, you know, get a job. I mean, I can't, I can't be a retired <laughs> colonel. I can't afford it anymore, man. <laughs> you know, if, if you want to come watch my channel and you want to make some super chats, feel free to do it. I mean, I kind of need them here. We're at the stand on the street corner of the tin cup here. I mean, look, the inflation is real. It's hurting people. But uh, yeah, as far as the election next year, I, I, I really can't make prediction, Gareth. Uh, everyone keeps asking me to make predictions. But what I can tell you without getting you in trouble on a, on a certain platform that we're on is that um, the choosing of 2024, I can't make predictions because I don't know what's going to play out in the 50 states. Each state has different election laws. And I know that my state violated its own laws last time and got away with it. So, you know, who knows what's going to happen? I can't it's tell you. It's your state, Georgia, Chris. No, no, it's Pennsylvania. That's that's where I All live right, right now, okay. Pennsylvania. Yeah. Right. No, no, they 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 had they had a law they passed in October 2019 before the Rona ever made an appearance, allowing for mail in balloting and for but you had to have mm. the signature. It had to be in by election night when the polls closed, and um, it had to go through the federal postal system because unlike South Africa's postal system, ours actually still works. It's expensive. It's not very good, but it works. And the key thing with our postal system is that when you send something through it, if you commit fraud, it's a five year felony conviction. And that's really? not negotiable. So if you take and you, you go to a, a retirement facility and you pull out of the mailbox of these people who have dementia and Alzheimer's and you take their ballots and you fill them out and you put them in the mail, the federal postal system, you get caught because your fingerprints are on it. You know, unless you wear gloves like they did in Georgia, uh, you put your fingerprints on it. Then that's uh, 25 years in the federal penitentiary. Now you probably get a plea deal. But the point is, there's jeopardy attached. Our state put boxes all over that were unguarded, no cameras, no sheriffs, no election officials. Uh, not in my county, but in the rest of the state. And then they also said they'd accept the ballots 10 days after the election, which means you could effectively see the result and then change it. And then the Supreme Court of the state even upheld that for three days. And then they said, we're not going to check the signatures. It's not required. So I can't account for what's going to happen like that in 50 states. So I don't know who's going to win. Um, it's anybody's guess. Well, I'm just going to say <laughs> one thing. You had uh, Trump on uh, Tucker Carlson's show last night. I heard there's that. Al there's already been 115 million views yeah. on that show. Yes, and, 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 that, and that, 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 that's in the Republican debate, that's for sure. Yes. Well, I mean, if you, if you consider the entire cumulative uh, viewing of all of U.S. television last night, 115 yeah. mu uh, million views is more than all of that put together. Yeah. Chris, oh, by a wide margin, yeah. Before we let you go, one last thing. Are, are they going to put him in jail? I mean, it, it, you know, they're joking that he will he will run from jail, but they really are trying with, you know, Stormy Daniels, the, 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 the Georgia governor. We've got a whole lot of cases that are mounting up against this guy. Is, is any of it going to stick? Uh, and and, and is, it, is it obviously political as it, as it looks? Oh, it's obviously as political as it looks. Look at the latest indictment from Jack Smith. He isn't even charged with a violation of federal statute. How can you have an indictment against someone for crimes that don't exist? He's, he's charged with lying. Lying's not a crime. I, I could tell Pumi that she's two meters tall, and that's a lie. That's not a crime. He's, he's accused of Why lying. Are you people this? <laughs> well, you should tell people that. They'll buy it. I mean, she's actually standing tall here, but no, but seriously. Um, so he's accused of lying that he won the election. Well, what about Hillary Clinton lying that she won the election? What about Stacey Abrams still lying that she won the election in Georgia? It's nonsense. I mean, that's now if if I am talked if I'm being talked to by a federal investigator, a law enforcement official in the course of the investigation, and I lie to them, that's a crime. You're perverting the means of justice. That but to Trump lying to people if, if that he did that he won is not a crime. Another thing he's charged with is exploiting the insurrection. First off, I was there. I have hours of video coverage of it. The FBI has no interest in the people who are trying to cite the crowd that I offered to them video and photographic evidence. They only want pictures of people going to the building. I was nowhere near the building, so I don't have that. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was not an insurrection. It was a, it was a riot that was, uh, but we, we won't get into that. But the point is that exploiting it, the problem with that, do you want to jump in there, Gareth? No, no, just uh, oh, because okay. I, I, so far I, I don't think um, there's, a, there's a whole lot uh, – that, that people who support Trump would disagree with you on. There are obviously Democrats who will say, but but he's a terrible person and he needs to go to jail. But if it is going to be a Trump, terrible again, person, not against the, no, 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 I know. But, but let's just skip ahead. So let's yeah. say it is Trump versus Biden again, uh, mm -hmm. and and Biden's he's he's not he's not all there. What if what if he dies? What happens then? What well, if it Kamala ends Harris becomes Trump president? Trump versus Kamala? Is that what is that what happens? 
It's the, it's not the vice president. There's somebody else in line before the vice president. No, the vice yeah. president's next. The vice president okay. becomes president. Lyndon James Johnson became president when Kennedy was assassinated. So he was vice president. That's what happens. It's a vice president, then speaker of the house comes third. Okay. Yeah. All right. So yeah. at the end of the last election, uh, I thought that the system is broken and now the whole world has seen it. Uh, but I also think Donald Trump broke the Republican Party. Well, um, the Republican Party broke the Republican Party. That's what I'll say. Donald Trump, it's interesting because people talk about Donald Trump that, you know, this MAGA movement and Trump this, well, those of us who are conservative patriotic Americans were here before Trump when he was a Democrat and he was pro-abortion and all those other things. And we'll be here long after Donald Trump. So uh, he is a great showman. He's a guy that knows how to take advantage and exploit things to his benefit, not the insurrection, but, <laughs> but, but actually politically. And, and, and he jumped on a bandwagon of anger over Obama and over America's decline in the world and over the nonsense with wokeness going on in America. And it was the right time. It was the right time. And he rode that and he became president as a consequence of that. So, you know, it's um, he didn't break the Republican Party. The Republican Party broke the Republican Party. I don't refer to the Republican Party as such. I refer to the Uniparty, the Democrats and Republicans in cahoots, burying us in debt, spending money we don't have, making ridiculous decisions. I mean, like, you know, having Juneteenth as a holiday. If people want to celebrate the end of legal bondage in America, the correct date is the 6th of December, because the 6th of December, 1865, is when the state's not in rebellion, passed the 13th Amendment, ending slavery in the United States. Not some date in June when a union general rocked up in Texas and said, you're all free here, even though 90% of the people in slavery were still in slavery in Texas. But the political cowards in Washington and the Republican Party have destroyed the Republican Party, not Donald Trump. The system is broken. The system yeah, gonna, is broken. We're going to have to end it there, I'm afraid. But Chris, as always, you were terrific. It's great to have you on the show. Canton, always uh, throwing a cat among the pigeons and there are lots of people disagreeing with you. Chris, <laughs> We will continue that discussion again. Uh, Pums, thank you very much. We'll see you next Thursday, everybody, on the Burning Platform. And otherwise, tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Be good. Have an excellent Thursday. Ciao.